Hey guys, what's going on? So The Little Things is one of the bigger movies on streaming right now. So I think one of the biggest questions of the film is who exactly was the killer and if in fact it was Albert Sparma. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through every hint that would indicate that it is actually Sparma being the killer. And then towards the end of the video, I'm going to cover what the director said about the killer and then give my final thoughts and conclusions on it. And just another heads up, this isn't, you know, really any sort of evidence that would be used in court. A lot of it would probably get thrown out for a number of reasons. Really, the focus here is just on whether or not Sparma actually did it. So first up in the first scene where we get just a quick glimpse of the killer, you get the indication that this isn't him. It doesn't really match his appearance. So one thing I wanted to do is take Jared Leto and see what he would look like without his full beard. And just for fun, I know it looks ridiculous, I just kind of painted in that goatee. So when you look at it from this perspective, I think there is a lot more of a heavy possibility that this is actually him. Looking at the cheek structure or the jawline, I think that's one of the more striking things here. Maybe a little bit of the nose doesn't exactly match. It could just be the angle or the shadow here. Whereas where he's pointed down a little bit, I think you get more of that match. And I also think it isn't that far out of the realm of possibility that he's wearing some sort of nose prosthetic just to keep his appearance different when he's actually trying to commit these murders. And then I think another thing with this is that he has a full beard when we first see him and then throughout the entire movie. And this really doesn't follow that long of a time period. So I think the obvious question here is how would he have a full beard just a few days after this possible event. And just looking at his facial hair, I would say that the sides going down to the goatee, I, I wouldn't say it's nearly as thick as the front section of his beard where that goatee would be, which is why we see more of a contrast because he only shaved that part off. And then later in the film, he evens it out. And then in terms of his longer hair, I think it's definitely possible when you look at some of those shots from the beginning, that he could have had his hair up in a ponytail or had it up in his hat. And again, wouldn't it be impossible for it to be a wig? Another thing I think that stands out, when watching him throughout the movie, he has a little bit of a limp. And then in this scene, it's really hard to tell if he exactly has that same limp. But I would say that it's not like he's chasing after the girl. It's not like he's running after her. And then following this scene, I think while it would be thrown out in court because it does become circumstantial evidence, since the girl ends up seeing him in handcuffs before identifying him, she still picks Sparma as the likely person that would have matched the potential killer's description from the beginning of the movie. So I would still say that's a hint that you can't ignore. With our first murder scene of the girl who's found inside of her apartment, I think it's really hard to ignore that her refrigerator was broken and that our potential suspect here, Sparma, is an appliance repairman. He is at a nearby appliance store to where the crime happened. And then not only that, we do get confirmation that she had some sort of an order in there uh, when Denzel Washington or Deacon gets both the employee and client list from the owner. We see her name crossed out, but I think that does confirm that that store knew her address and knew that she had a broken refrigerator, so that definitely could be an easy way for Sparma to find a reason to be let in. And then I think the real nail on the coffin here is that the wires match what was on the victim. And then outside of the store, you have the roast beef market. We know that the victim was vegan, but she did find traces of roast beef in her digestive tract. And then we even find out that two of the employees have records, one being a 55 year old male. And then of course, Sparma being the younger one who lives in Hollywood. In the first confrontation we get between him and Deacon, we find out some more information. Denzel Washington confirming the high mileage on his car. And then another thing I think is really suspicious is that we find some pretty heavy indication here that he switches cars a lot. 
There's obviously the heavy focus on the harvester being an abandoned car that he reported stolen. And then I think even just something that's briefly said that doesn't get as much attention throughout the movie is that Denzel Washington was able to get this first interaction by posing as someone being interested in buying his car. Obviously, it wasn't for sale. We see the for sale sign on the ground, and Sparma alludes to that being from one of the past cars that he sold, or one of the cars that he sold recently, and it's just the sign that had been knocked off on the ground. So I think it's pretty safe to say he goes through a lot of cars. That car he sold could have easily been that blue Mercury from the beginning of the movie, and then his trash we see a matching beer can to what was in the fridge of our first victim. We get some more information when Deacon's following him. He even stops at one of the direct spots of a recent crime scene. And then we get some more insight with both the police knowledge and the interrogation scene. We find out that he falsely committed to a crime before. This was something that he even signed into a confession and they released him the next day because they found out he wasn't anywhere near the exact spot. I think all of this was intentional so that the police department wouldn't take him seriously going forward. And then we hear from the police department that he left town about six weeks after those earlier murders when Denzel Washington was the head detective. And then also we know that the murders returned after he's now back in Hollywood. And while he was gone, it's alluded that there was a lot of murders done in Detroit where he moved to. And then I think when we go into his living space or his apartment, something you don't see very often, one of the tops of his kitchen knives has been cut off and we know all of the victims here died from stab wounds. We then see these additional beer cans that match both the first crime scene and what was in his trash. We also see that he has a police radio. Maybe this was done to show that's how he knew where the body is, but I would say that it's still suspicious. The photo development room, I think, is also suspicious. We also see a map, which could be how he knows the highway so well. And then I think one of the things you really can't ignore is that hidden compartment under his floor where Deacon finds newspaper articles, especially of the earlier killings, the ones under the bridge. It's really rare that someone would just be fascinated with crimes and save those exact newspaper articles. And then towards the end of the movie, we obviously get the climax. I would say it's a little bit strange that he takes them to almost like this vacant pit of dirt because this really isn't that fitting to the pattern of the victim. So I think if anything, this was just a wild goose chase to throw the police off. And then we obviously get the end result of the movie. And I think we're still left with some pretty heavy questions. Another common argument you could get from this is that, well, maybe Sparma wasn't exactly the killer, but he was some sort of an accomplice. That's why he went back and visited the crimes. I think that's definitely possible, but I don't think he was the accomplice. We do have that little suggestion that there were two employees there that had records and then looking at that initial description you could say that there's also a guy sitting there with a goatee who looks like he could be around the age of 55. It's possible he was the killer and Sparma was just in with him but I think that's highly unlikely. For one I think it's really hard to believe that him and his friend would work together and none of the other employees would pick up on any of it. And then I think it's really hard to believe that him and his friend would have both left and gone to Detroit and come back and that not have looked suspicious. And if only Sparma went and not this other guy. I think it's weird that the killings didn't continue when Sparma was gone. I find it hard to believe that if he was just the accomplice, he would still be so worried about his cars. For instance, in the first scene, if he wasn't in fact that guy chasing after the girl, I don't see why he would be as worried about changing cars so often. So I think that really hurts the accomplished possibility. And in terms of that director's statement, he said that he specifically wanted to give just as many points to the guilt of Sparma being a killer as to his innocence. My own takeaway from this, I would say 
there's really too many points of guilt that you can't ignore. And I would say the points of innocence don't really do enough. I wouldn't say there's any sort of alibi that he has. I think those are just vague inserts to just entertain the possibility that he didn't do it. But let me know your thoughts on this. I appreciate you watching and I'll see you later.